week's episode of The Deadliest Files, we interview Peter Matera about playing with his brothers and dealing with racism in the 90s. One of our 16 deadliest players, Peter Matera, West Coast Eagles champion, Norm Smith medalist, dual premiership player. Welcome and thanks for taking the time to have a chat. Thanks, Tone, and uh, yeah, looking for this, uh, this little chat between us. Who's your mob and where are you from? Yeah, so I'm uh, from the Nalakala Budja clan, the Noongar clan from down south of uh, WA. Yeah. Um, and also I've got um, my grandfather's up at uh, Baladong, which is up near um, Brookton area. So, yeah, a uh, bit of a mix, but it's um, it's good to have a heritage like that. I know you've got a big, a big family and, um, you know, in Indigenous culture and, of course, Italian culture, because you did make the Italian team of the century as well. Family is so... Um, I guess it's such a big part of the culture. What was it like growing up um, with so many people around? Yeah, I guess with uh, Dad coming from Italy, I guess uh, his his religion and his um, heritage was pretty strong um, with all his Italian mates that he came over from uh, from Italy. Um, still, still to this day, still around the, around uh, WA. Yeah. Um, and also with Mum, so you know the heritage on both sides were pretty strong, and and I guess. Um, you know, with the families of us as uh, myself and seven other siblings. <laughs> so um, there was no TV down here with Dad uh, and Mum. But, um, yeah, we, we uh, all get on really, really well. And it's, uh, you know, it's it's a great family um, gathering when it comes to um, Christmas times and stuff. I want to talk to you about what it was like growing up and, you know, kicking the footy around and all that kind of stuff. Um, did things get uh, pretty hot and heavy in the backyard? Oh, yeah, all, all, all the time. Um, we used to play out the front and it used to be um, bitumen and we used to use the telephone poles and uh, and the trees as a as a goals and we used to have all the fam- um, neighbours of all the Indigenous guys around town and a couple of our non-Indigenous guys would join in and um, but we'd, we'd play that game of footy and um, when it comes across the road, you've got to make sure you don't fall over or get tackled so you've got to run a bit fast. Keep your feet. That's where I got my speed from. <laughs> yeah. Keep your feet. Uh, and then we used to play the rucks all on the... Uh, neighbours' lawns, so, you know, throwing the ball up and so forth and have your midfield. So, no, we had great times there growing up and I guess uh, all our skills from not only myself but all the uh, other Indigenous boys that played on uh, on that turf, um, you know, the skills came about. When you were a kid running around, when it, when it might have just been you kicking the footy, who were you pretending to be? Stephen Michael's family members used to live across the road and, and when Stephen used to play for South Fremantle, he used to come down and visit these and when I used to see him, pull up in the front yard and the big fella get out and uh, go over there. I couldn't wait to get over on the front lawn and have a look at him. And, <laughs> and um, you know, he was, he was pretty much uh, mine growing up with Morris Rioli around that time. Um, and then when I pretty much made the transition, it was, it was more um, Nicky Wimmer, that type of type of guys that uh, I looked up to. So, but, but Stephen would have been that because he was pretty much across the road when he used to visit. You hear everyone talk about him you know, being the greatest never to play in the national competition. And then for you to have that kind of almost glimpse behind the curtain of seeing him in, in, in the real world, you know, what was that like for a young kid who loved his footy? Oh, it was, uh, it was amazing because my brother Wally had the opportunity to go and play for South Fremantle. And then in that side you had Nick, uh, Nicky Wimmer, um, Stephen Michaels, um, Brioli, all these guys that were in that, around that era. Yep. Um, I used to go up and um, go to the change rooms and see the boys in their lives. So it was, it was awesome to see them and how big they were. And, and uh, you know, ones, you know, back in the day, we used to watch it on, on TV, you know, and you'd get around <laughs> the lounge room and watch your idols and that. So, um, yeah, to, to see him in person and to see him um, play the way that he played, um, big impact on Indigenous football. At what point did you realise, you know, this, this might be something I might be able to do? Yeah, I guess I was around about that 16, 17 years of age where Wally was playing for South Fremantle and, and he used to come back home to, to, to Wagen and then uh, he would say, you know, it's, it's time for you to move up to Perth and try out with South. And, and, and that time he was in the um, on, in the borderlines of, of this new side of the Eagles coming through in, not, in 87. I came up in 86, I think it was. Yeah, He was pretty much the big influence of getting up there. And plus my other brother, Michael, was pretty much living in Perth and he just pretty much said, look, you can stay with me but as long as you play footy and, and stick at it and, and make something of it, um, you know, we'll back you all the way. So I made that transition around 17, 16, 17 to go to South Fremantle and then, you know, uh, three years and then the Eagles. 
What was that like for you when you first made that move from South Fremantle into the Eagles locker rooms? And especially because it's just a newly formed club as well. So pr- probably a unique experience there. Yeah, it was. It was, um, you know, the guys that, that I, was, I was looking up to were, you know, Johnny Worsfold, Michael Brennan, Chris Mainwaring. These are the guys who were playing in the waffle at that time with my brother Wally. And they were the best footballers in WA playing with West Coast. So... I really had to, you know, pull my head in in some way because it's another league, another level. Um, and a lot of support was around me at that time with main wearing the worst bowls, yeah. the swimmages, um, that really helped me nourish as, as a person. Not so much as a footballer, but as a person in this professional life. In 91, you know, you, you come forth in the Brownlow. Then the next year, 92, you win the flag. You famously win the Norm Smith. Not only, you know, do you win the Norm Smith, You've won the first flag outside Victoria and you're bringing it back to a one-club town in WA in Perth. Was that really hard to navigate in terms of the instant level of, I guess, notoriety and fame and all of that stuff that goes with it? Because you guys were rock stars. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was amazing because it was that one-team town. Um, you know, all the restaurants, nightclubs, wherever you went, they pretty much gave us the key of, of that support. Um, so it was pretty wild. Um, wherever you went, people in the in the shopping malls um, all over Perth, um, you couldn't go anywhere. But when you did go out, um, you know, you were rocked up. I mean, was that quite hard, you know, um, to kind of stay balanced? Yeah, it was. It was, it was. it was hard because you couldn't you couldn't go anywhere without getting hassled in, in yeah. some regard. And I guess because of the performance of the Norm Smith and um, you know how we played as a, as a team, we were on notice on, for the next year and so forth. And how we pretty much conducted ourselves outside of footy. Um, so there's a big difference to really uh, take a step back and be older than what you really are. Yeah, so we were only. In our early 20s. Yeah. So it was, it was huge. In 94, you win it again. What was it like being being part of a team that was an absolute juggernaut? I think the way we went about it, um, winning the grand final, it was, it was more how we conducted ourselves as a group outside the footy club. So we had, you know, player gatherings, players, you know, player meetings and, and just, you know, going down to the pub or going somewhere, meeting at someone's house. So the camaraderie of the of the actual squad was a really tight knit. So every time we went out to play a game of footy, we believed that we could beat anyone yeah. um, because we knew how to play in Victoria, we knew how to play in Queensland, all these places. So And we had a great squad uh, and some great, great players. What's it like once you take that step into becoming one of those elite players that is first one that the opposition or one of the first one that the opposition start going, he's who we need to stop? Yeah, I, I guess um, now that I've retired and, and it's been so many years and you catch up with a lot of players, opposition players that you played on against or played in those those sides against, they always said, you know, you're probably the first five that we'd have to watch to uh, try and um, nullify the influence during games. And, and that's probably why I pretty much got tagged on a wing, which I couldn't believe that you get actually tagged on a wing. So you really had to go that next level and having Johnny Worsfold and Michael Brennan and Guy McKenna and these guys next year and just saying, whoosh, can you just give me a couple of metres on this break, you know, and they're here to do it. You played through a period where there was a lot of change, like, like there was still a lot of racism, you know, around footy back then, but also a lot of steps forward happened. What you guys went through made it so much easier for Mick and, and Goodsy and those boys, and then those boys made it easier again for, you know, when, when guys like me come through. Yeah, I guess when when uh, I was coming through, there was a, there was a fair bit of it, uh, racism in, in, in the game. Christy Lewis and Troy Ugal and a few others, we pretty much, and every other club, rallied, rallied together to try and be united as Indigenous players. And there's a lot of players that really come out of the woodwork that really weren't Aboriginal, but that they, they really, then they identify themselves as Aboriginal players. So the colour of their skin was a bit lighter. So a lot of people back then didn't really know, even myself, a lot of people didn't think that I was Aboriginal because I had a, um, another background in, in Italian background. So... Um, and once they start digging into it and then they start finding out that you are Aboriginal, yep, you start getting a bit of that as well. So 
it did happen back then, but I think that we've come a long way now because we're all we're all equal, we're all one, and you know the best magic out in the footy field is black magic, you know, <laughs> because you've got because you've got all the best footballers out there playing the game today, uh, nearly all Aboriginal players. People talk about you know being being light skin and then you know um, what that's like because that's a challenge on its own, and a lot of non-Aboriginal people don't understand what it's like you know, for it not to be obvious or to walk between those two worlds. What was that like for you? Yeah, especially in the in the Italian side of, of Dad's side, when they, you know, they said, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you're not Aboriginal, you're Italian. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm both. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of lot of that going through. It even went through my school, school years because um, having an Italian father and an Aboriginal mother. Um, so it, it, it got through to the AFL where I was a little bit light-skinned so you get the guys like Louis was a bit more darker skin. Then you got Troy Hugh and a few others that had darker skin would get picked on more. Um, and then when that stance of of Nicky went down, we all rallied around um, each other at each club. Yeah. And you got Gilbert McAdam and and, and Longing all that led led that stand with uh, Gilbert. Um, we all rallied together and then everyone came out and then all of a sudden we were on notice and everyone knew who we were. Yeah. Um, because and then all of a sudden it, everything started changing around then because we weren't just you know it wasn't just the color of your skin it was in it was, it was inside yeah so it was massive it was massive for us to be able to come out because it was it was a lot of hurt especially in with our, my mother and that with her um her, her family with a stolen generation and so forth it's so hard. she didn't get to see them a lot for a long time so there's a lot of hurt there. But as you go through the AFL, there was a lot of hurt in the early days, but today's footy is totally different and everyone's educated a lot more. Who are some of the Indigenous boys um, who are your favourites uh, to watch? Um, Liam Ryan, probably my my one for uh, for West Coast. So um, good. Yeah, to see him take some marks and in that grand final and, and um, coming on as a young, young boy and, and he's doing really well, f- um, you know, coming from... Um, outside of WA to, to play there, and I, I, being in WA but going to West Coast, um, I remember uh, Lewis Jetta. You know, like I, I remember training with Lewis and teaching him, and I helped him get drafted to Sydney Swans. And to see him back at the club at, at West Coast is, is huge um, because he's got the same sort of pace as mine. And, and if he wants to go, he can go. Ah, uh, mate, there's so many of them. Like it's it's hard to name one. Um, but That's what every black fella does. No one just says one. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, because there, there's a cool mob of um, black fellas out there that's playing awesome footy. What does it mean to, to be regarded in the 16 deadliest Indigenous players? For you to be, you know, held in that regard, what does that mean to you? You know, it's, it's not a dream come true. It's, it's just a privilege to be able to play the game that I loved and to be like some of my idols that I cherished and, and you know, some have passed away. But uh, to see them, uh, I'll see me in that same league um, and that, you know, in the deadliest, I think um, I can take my hat off um, because it's it's a great achievement for myself to just to be recognised in that group. So um, thanks to the AFL and, you know, the, uh, the, the recognition. Thanks for taking the time um, for, to, to, to have this chat. And again, um, you're an absolute champion, champion bloke as well, which is really, really important for, for our people to know. And um, I'm looking forward to catching up with you next time I see you. Beautiful. Thanks, Jerry. Don't forget to tune in to Yokai Footy at 8pm Wednesdays on NITV and the AFL Network.